I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, this is our artist talk with Laura Bidwell. Um, our current exhibition, Six Plus One, is a group show of works by seven artists, um, with Laura as our plus one, our featured artist. Um, this is her first time exhibiting at Hammond Harkins Galleries, and today is the last day of the exhibit. Uh, for those of you who don't know Laura, um, she's been active in the arts in Columbus for over 20 years. Uh, she received her um, MFA in painting and drawing from The Ohio State University in 1996. And prior to that, she received her um, BFA in painting with a minor in art history from the um, Indiana University of Bloomington, uh, where incidentally, she also received her Bachelor of Arts in Journalism. Um, she's been active, um, actively exhibiting her work in solo and group shows um, since graduating from OSU and even before then. Um, she has been in numerous exhibitions. Uh, here in Columbus, she has had several exhibitions at the Rebecca Evil Gallery. Um, she has also exhibited at the Columbus College of Art and Design's um, Kanzani Center Gallery, which is now the Beeler Gallery. Um, she's also had work in a group exhibition at the Columbus Museum of Arts um, that was called Minimalism. It was a group show um, with work of Laura's um, together with works by artists including Carl Andre, Solowitz, and Donald Judd. Um, currently on view, um, she has work in a new, um, it's called New American Paintings in Midwest Edition. Um, that's an exhibition at the Elmhurst Art Museum in Elmhurst, Illinois. And coming up in August, opening August 2nd at the Dublin Arts Council, uh, will be Laura Bidwa Wonder 48. So there are other exhibitions. There's a whole lot of information about Laura, uh, but you can check that online um, on the artist's website. Um, for now, we'll talk about the work itself. Um, and the paintings that we have here in this room with us, um, with the artists. So there are uh, six paintings total. Uh, this is a mini exhibition within a larger exhibition. Um, all of these works date from 2015 to the present. Um, the most recent work is at the very front of the gallery. So we have one in the front, and then we have four here, and then one around this corner. And actually, I mean the actually, earliest. Yeah. So the earliest painting is in the front. Um, it is titled, um, women and painting. Um, it has a different format than everything else. That one is a horizontal painting. And I think more importantly, uh, it has the single kind of cloud-like formation, which we used to see a lot in your previous work and seems to have disappeared or transformed in these recent paintings. But these works um, still seem like they're connected to what came before. And I think that's the case with your work in general. Um, it seems like everything is part of a single body of work. Um, you don't really do series, I think, different series. Not too much, yeah. Everything seems to be part of this single trajectory in which you are thinking things through slowly, um, using the language of abstraction to do that. Um, you always, but you didn't always do abstract painting. Um, actually, a long time ago, um, you used to do landscapes. Uh, could you please tell us um, about that shift from landscapes to abstract paintings and how maybe um, landscapes that you did earlier can inform the work that we're looking at here in the gallery? Yeah, um, I think, well, when I was an undergrad, we, my training as an undergraduate was in painting from life. And I think most painters who work from life don't see a really bright line between abstraction and realism. And um, at that time, I also just fell into landscape as something I couldn't stop looking at or thinking about. It was just really clear and easy and straightforward, like, that's what I'm going to do, you know? And so. I'm looking at landscape all that time, and all the work I did for probably 15 years after that was observational landscapes. And it was focusing on color and a certain kind of composition and a certain kind of gesture. Um, but it wasn't necessarily focusing on drawing trees or anything. Um, and then, at a certain point, I started thinking, is there something wrong with me if I'm afraid to make a line, you know? And so instead of making paintings that were all about shifting colored things that fit together to make a contour, like a landscape, mm -hmm. I thought I should be really brave and try and draw trees, you know, and like try and draw branches and see if I can do that. 
and it led me into a whole series of work, probably starting in about 19, probably the late 90s into the early 2000s that um, kind of came alongside the other work I was doing and was much more representational, um, at least in the sense that people would look at them and know that it was a tree, you know? And so, I forgive me, I brought a couple paintings with me that are a little bit older paintings because I thought it would be nice for us since this isn't a big auditorium with big PowerPoint slides or something. We're a nice small group in a nice small space um, for me to be able to just say, well, here's what I'm talking about. Here's an older one, here's an older one. Um, and so this kind of relates to the kind of drawing that I was talking about. Um, it's a series of work that I did that, it's colored pencil on chalkboard paint. And so um, the thing that I liked about that was that it looks like chalk and it looks like it'll brush away immediately and it's actually pretty tough. And I thought using something that looked like it was fragile and not fragile was pretty fun. And it also forced me, there was no way for me to avoid making a mark that everyone could see really easily. So I guess just to try and pull it back to the question of what happened between landscape and abstraction, there wasn't really an either or moment. Um, there was a time in between about 2000 and 2010 where I was doing work like this at the same time I was doing work like these that was really abstract or at least looked less like trees. Um, and so the two bodies of work were kind of flowing along. And then I reached a point where the drawing-based work that I was doing got a little bigger and a little more intense and like needed full attention. And the painting work that I was doing also kind of needed more attention. And I only have limited time. And so I, I felt like I needed to pick one, you know? Not that I could never do the other one again, but that I needed to, to pick something to push, you know, to keep it so that I wasn't doing the same thing over and over. And um, I think it was Tim Rienbach at the time who totally rejected all the drawing ones and said, you should be painting more. <laughs> And so I uh, went back to some of the works like this that hadn't been cradled yet and sanded them down. And I liked how complicated that surface got and how this surface that I had been used to touching just with a pencil and, and having to be a little bit sparing with all of a sudden made this really freaky, weirdo place to paint on. You know, it added this whole like mashup layer of stuff happening. And so that was the point at which I thought, I'm going to keep looking at the same things I've always been looking at, which is trees. And I'm going to look for different things and paint out of that in that way on this kind of background, if that makes any sense. It's like if you work from observation, you know how differently you see different things all the time. Like even if you're just trying to capture one aspect of it, you can never quite see enough to totally get it. You know, maybe some people can, I never could. And so um, this work started probably about five years ago with me trying to look back at the same things and really see different things and to paint different ideas all at the same time. or it, on top of each other. Um, so that was the landscape to abstraction kind of transition such as it is. I mean, it's all still there together in my head. It's still the same thing. And when you were doing landscapes and painting trees, you weren't trying to have an exact rendering of what you saw. Really, it was more like um, a rendering of things observed or sensed. I think there were two main things that I was focusing on when the work was more realistic. And one of it was, one of those things was a, a thing that I have about painting being 
a very physical and simultaneously very illusionistic thing. Like the painting to me is like a skin or a veil of something that's the painting that sits on something else. How am I going to say this right? And so, um, one of the things that when I was doing the realistic, more realistic things, I was always thinking about is how deep is that? Like, how do I lay that on something um, with what I can see? And the other thing that I'm always, that recently I've been more interested in is a group of trees as a gesture. It's almost like I'm painting, a figure painting, you know, like, I find it really emotional how trees grow next to each other and how a tree gets denser as it grows and has a kind of, I'm going to go like this, body language. <laughs> you know, like, and the way limbs and branches rest in the air, you know, and how they move a little bit. Um, and so I f find a lot of emotional meaning in taking a group, one tree or two trees or three trees together and think about how it's kind of standing in the air and, and how the language of those trees next to each other says something to me or reflects something that I'm thinking about. Um, and so the work that was more realistic like this, sometimes it was like this that's a little bit more about a pattern of marks that I think some of the more detailed ones like this are a little bit more about the veil and a group of marks making something. There were other paintings that were more about a clump of trees sitting on a surface um, and whether they looked like they were going up or coming down or coming at you or whether they were hunched like this or leaning to one side or graceful or stupid looking. And I think that aspect comes into these paintings much more. Okay. Um, the mark making has dropped back a little bit, although I think the mark making stuff translates into my fabulous array of crazy funny dots <laughs> and smushes and smudges and smashes. And... So would you like to talk about that, about the different ways that you work your surface? Um, as you were talking about, um, I guess, illusion and the object, um, I was thinking about how you sand the background I mean, that's just one way you work your surface. You apply paint and you also take, take paint away. Would you like to tell everyone about the various ways that you, as I said, work your surface? Some of these paintings, like the first two, you can see there's a, a cream colored edge on the side of the panel. And then the black comes, there's, it's black on the edges on the top and the bottom and it, the black kind of figuratively wraps around the panel and that, kind of comes from the work like this, where I was, I really like to be able to look at an edge and see it as a really dumb physical edge at the same time your eye wants to turn it into something else. Like that's something that's really happening in the work I did like this, where you're looking at, and you'll get a chance to look at this closer, but to make an edge where you can see that it's just like a smudge of paint and you can see the edge of it and your mind is looking at it as paint and as a depth at the same time. Um, so anyway, when I was doing these drawings, I liked that you could look at, at this as a graphic thing, but also it was a physical thing that was not, ugh, I'm getting a little tangled up here. To back up, the sanding is a way to try and make the surface be physical and illusion at the same time. And it's also a way to get me away from, I was doing a lot of work on panels that were painted solid colors, kind of like these, and often it would be a really intense color and kind of glossy paint. And um, painted wood is just a disaster <laughs> to like not damage. And when I was relying on these panels that had very smooth sheets of paint on them, the least little thing would nick it or mess it up, and then people would be like, why has it got that damage? And I was like, it started to drive me nuts because I don't, 
I don't want to be a very, I'm not that kind of person in terms of fussiness and that level of control. And so this kind of surface also gave me a way to still have a really physical paint presence and to have something that kind of pushes itself against the painting, the painting that's on top, but have it take in and absorb whatever happens to it. Like it can get dirty, you can drop things on it. You know, like it's, it's, it can be in real life a little bit more, um, which is another good thing about sanding. Um, and one other thing about it is that it feels so nice to your hand. I mean, these paintings, I think about them a lot in terms of their dimensionality because some of the marks are very three-dimensional and some of them are, are very um, smooth and flat. And if you've ever sanded down a piece of painted wood, you know how beautiful that surface is. Like that surface, once you've sanded paint with really fine sandpaper, it feels like suede. It is the best. And I can tell you these are the best things to like run your hand across, you know? And so it, to me, it adds a big, physicality aspect for me as as I work and I think also for people who get to have them and hold them later you know like when you're the artist you get to lay your hand right on top of that and you can feel like the bumpy parts and the flat parts and the really smooth parts and it is um it is awesome <laughs> and so black was the perfect color for you to do that there's no art historical reference. There's no symbolism. It's just formally black was perfect for that. Well, it came out of the freak occurrence that chalkboard paint, when I first started the work like this, came in black and this really interesting, like muddy gray green, you know, like the color that you think of as chalkboard colors. And so it was inadvertent in a way when I started. And I always found it funny because people, you really don't see that much black in art, you know? And it's interesting, like I was taught when I was, this is another undergraduate thing, because we were all taught in, to paint from observation, we were also taught that mixing colors was really, really important, like that you never just used anything out of the tube, that you were always, you never just looked at anything and said, that's black, you know? You were always trying to think and see what that black whether it was a red black or a kind of green black or a yellowy black and you're mixing that color. And so even with black, I feel like I can play these games with the colors against it, but people don't notice it because they think it's just black, you know? So I feel like I have all these tricks going on that are really fun to me as a painter. And with these paintings, another like if you've ever drawn figures from observation, you know that process of kind of like measuring and marking out um, your pos the position of things in space as you're working from observation. And that's one of the functions that these little dots have. And so of course when you've got this black surface of indeterminate spatial depth and you're making these little dots on it, it's as dopey and constellation-y as it could possibly be, and I think that's fine too. You know, I really like that the dots can function as a kind of goofball decorative thing, and at the same time, the reference to stars and the cosmos is right there. Like, you can't separate them, you know? They're stupid and deep and distant at the same time. I like them that they're very precise and deliberate. Yeah. So there's no reference there to the drips of abstract expressionism that are kind of sloppy. Um, it's something else very different. As you just said, it's more about mapping out what you're going to do. But it's interesting. It's also still about a gesture. You know, like when I think about abstract expressionists, it's looser, but the paintings are often still organized around a network of gestures that kind of knits together. And when I'm making 
these dots, they kind of work the same way. They're kind of like mapping out a series of compositional gestures that knit together and sort of hold the painting in a place. And um, it's funny because when I was making my list of like, don't forget every artist you've ever thought about if anyone asks you like what <laughs> artist you like before I did this. I was thinking about uh, one of the earliest artists I really fell in love with as an undergraduate was Pontormo and Italian Mannerists because some of my professors were very serious figure painters and I got to go on a program in Florence and I'm now realizing that the thing that hasn't left me about those paintings is mannerism and how those big figure paintings are big compositions organized around these networks of gestures, you know, which is so beautiful. Like I thought about it and I was like, oh my God, I'm still thinking about that. And it still seems really meaningful to me because trees kind of do the same thing. And when I'm making my paintings, I'm trying to make that same kind of network of things in the painting that link together and kind of suspend you and hold you and show you where you are in the painting and lead your eye around in that same way. So to me, it, it's funny, the dots are precise, but they're precise in a way of, let's say 25 years of practice of like how to draw and like where things are they're not precise in the way that I labor over them. You know, I just know where I'm moving and make the dot, and it sits in a certain way. Um, the thing that I'm really fussy about, though, is that sometimes I have a whole vocabulary of dots. Some of them are little and round and glossy, and some of them are really spoogy, and some of them are kind of pointed. And I... Um, I like the looseness and the variety and the um, sort of, in a way, half-assedness of how things can happen together and make a painting. Um, and so the one thing about the dots that's really deliberate is what type of dot it is. Mm -hmm. You know, on the day that I'm making that series of things, I'm thinking about them being one way. Like, they're like one kind of actor in the painting at a time. So this leads me to another question. I'm just like with any artist, there are decisions and choices. Um, some of them I think you make in advance, and then there are some that just happen as you're working. Uh, some of the, the decisions that you make in advance uh, seem to be, at least lately, um, the panel size. They are 22 by 17 inches. Um, they are vertical. Um, you have a strong figure ground relationship with a lot of ground. There's black. So those choices already made, um, and the paints in front of you, the panel in front of you, um, what, how do you begin a painting? Is there an idea? Um, what do you start with? I actually have a series of reference photographs that I've taken of trees and groups of trees, and they kind of get beat to death, like I've been using the same set for probably three or four years now of maybe five or six images. And so how I decide where to start is kind of like, it's about when I walk to the studio that day, what kind of day it is outside and like how I'm feeling and if it's really windy or if it's hot, you know, or if I'm, I mean, there's a lot of I think it's sensual and emotional content that's sitting in me when I'm ready to start doing something. And then I need to look at the picture and see something about that that feels like the goal, you know? I don't have a full painting's worth of ideas at a time. I have like a step of ideas at a time. So. I might look at that picture that day and say, I didn't really notice that really lavenderish thing about it before, and I'm gonna start with a lavenderish thing. And then I 
put that painting aside for a couple days and I bring it back out and I'm like, oh man, that looks really pink and stupid and I'm actually thinking about something different and I do something a little different to it. And so it's this interaction over time of different states of mind, different things that are going on, how I'm looking at that photograph that day, how the painting has developed up to that point. I remember the day we went to um, Laura's studio. Uh, the sun was shining, um, there was music playing, and at the very beginning, I didn't know if that was coming from somewhere else in the building or from a different room. I think it was coming from a different room, which was a very lovely studio that when you look out the window, you see the tops of buildings and trees. Um, and it was a beautiful day. It was really gorgeous out. And after we left, I thought, Amor's probably going to start painting. Um, I don't know if that's just a, the romantic vision that I have of what you do, um, but it seems like that does play a role um, in painting. Yeah. Um, the second floor is good because you can look out into the sky. Mm -hmm. um, the work like this for all this time came from observation of the sky every day, and so I still do that a lot. Like, and I'm interested, I always feel uh, awakened by the question of what color's the sky today? You know, like how heavy is the air? What's it looking like? You know, like how does that feel? Is it cold or hot or whatever? And so it's nice with the second floor studio to kind of look out and be able to see the interaction between what the sky is doing and what the ground is doing. And there's also a lot of really prosaic and unexciting trees that grow around, but I kind of like that too, because there are kind of trees that you don't notice when you walk around. And that was something that um, stuck with me for years about trees is that how often they're sort of right there next to you and you don't notice them because you just walk by them and yet they're pretty interesting always and so like I have this whole palette of very prosaic three quarters of trees that I can see from the window and that sometimes that will be a good idea too. The very basic, basic question is um, relates to the cloud-like formation so that cloud-like formation goes back to very directly those earlier paintings of trees. Yeah and to a question that I had to myself for a while of, I, I had done a lot of kind of more line focused painting for a while and I started to be nervous that I was unable to make a mass, you know, with a paintbrush. And so I started trying to make the marks, um, make a mass instead of outline an edge of a mass or make an edge it's, it's a little painter-y to try and describe it, but to try to make a mask that's doing something in the composition is a sort of overall project that has a kind of body language uh, or that has a density or a rising or a falling or a dumb texture or something like that. That's the importance of the masses. It's almost like they're, um, they're, they're, the mass is an actor in the painting. And sometimes the mass is more massive, like mass-y, and sometimes it's, it's created by a web of different kinds of marks. And another question has to do um, with the landscapes. So the horizontal format seems more conducive to landscapes. And as you're moving away from that, that kind of mass, um, you've also changed your format from a horizontal to a vertical format. Could you discuss that a little bit more? Um, that seems like something very distinctly um, recent in your work, right? Yeah, over the past couple of years, I, I decided that with the, this body of work that's trying to be more open, um, more various, that it might be better not to use a really landscape associated format, you know, to change it so that 
it didn't just automatically resolve itself into a horizon of some kind. And I also kind of enjoy how close to the size of your face this little field is. Um, it's one of the reasons why I work at this size is so the paintings are really with you as you look at them and not something that you can stand halfway across. I mean, you can stand, you can see them from far away and stuff, but it's, it's supposed to be intimate. It's supposed to be very personal scale. And um, I really appreciate that it's so close, like it's almost like a, a little structure to put on your face <laughs> or like to hang in front of your face so that it can be right there with you. Um, and be intimate, like a little mirror or a portrait. I mean, a portrait versus landscape format. Uh, recently, there was someone in the gallery who made the comment uh, that these works were inexplicable. And I can't remember, that. I think that was the word that he used. Um, I know that that was the meaning and probably was the word inexplicable, but he meant that as um, a compliment. And so we told Laura, and she understood that as a compliment and appreciated that. I think I might have squealed. <laughs> uh, she's like, that's it, yes. And you elaborated by saying, well, you want your paintings to exist outside language. I think it's more like, well, I don't know if there's a good way for me to explain it, but I don't want my paintings to be any more explicable than I find the world to be explicable. Like I, I Painting from observation is something that's not explicable to me. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I'm not a very systematic thinker. But I also think I do feel like the world is full of aspects that in our minds we can't make coexist, but nonetheless coexist. Um, and that's the inexplicability about it to me. Um, I, I, sometime in the last couple of days, I ran across this passage that said something about a moment in time when the person who was speaking had realized that there was a difference between consciousness and reality. And that's a little bit of what I'm talking about, um, that I, I find there's a fundamental, fundamental inexplicability that I think you can touch or like you can feel by leaving a lot of questions unresolved or open. Um, I, one of the things that I'm trying to do more and more with the paintings is make them um, more open, more broad, more doofy looking. You know, like I want to let them look um, a little less known, like not as if I were in control because I'm not, and not as if you know what they are. Like I want to make color combinations that refer different directions. I want to make marks that don't necessarily look like artistic marks. Um, and I want to see if I put it on this surface and try and get it to cohere, like how much I can get it to cohere and how much I can let it not cohere and not make sense. So that's, that's another way of getting it inexplicable. Maybe a little slightly awkward. Does that sound right? Yes. Um, yeah. And I think those are the works that, at least for me personally, are the most pleasurable when you don't have all the answers. And to a large degree, you have to put your faith in the artist. Um, it's almost like taking a leap. And those are the works that I think um, really are the most enjoyable and seems like your paintings. 
That's what I'm trying to get. And because I think hmm, it's funny to me as an artist how much I definitely feel a sense of yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, as I work. Like I, I'm making them in a very specific way. Um, and I know when I think it's doing the right thing and when I don't think it's doing the right thing. And it's funny to me and I guess just paradoxical that I want them to not, to make a certain amount of coherent sense and to make another way of not sense or not clarity. Yeah, I don't, yeah. <laughs> I have another question. Um, that you're a woman really seems like a non-issue, um, especially here at Hammond Harkins Galleries. Um, you know, this show has seven artists in it, five of them are women, and I thought about that, and I thought, well, that's not even worth mentioning, um, but then you bring it up. We have that painting at the front that's called Women and Painting. Um, and whenever that issue comes up in the context of um, painting, it seems to be in terms of abstract painting and the history of the medium as being dominated by men. Is that something that you even, that you consciously think about or work against? Or it's just, it's there and you don't even think about it, you just paint. Well, that painting was named um, after an essay by Marlene Dumas about women in painting that is much more articulate um, and funny and aggressive um, than my own thinking is. Um, not, yeah, so, the simplest thing is there's this great essay called Women in Painting by Marlene, by Marlene Dumas that talks about her relationship to being a woman and being a painter. Um, but I also would say I don't find it to be true that only abstract expressionism has been dominated by men because every area of art has been dominated by men and still is. Um, And specific instances notwithstanding over the arc of history, I think that's true. And I'm comfortable saying that and it's fine. Um, but I've also been thinking since you asked me about that last week, I was thinking about another thing related to being a woman that has kind of weighed upon me, and that is the way women are so closely observed and so closely observe each other, and the way that affects my level of visual attention to the world, and also um, to a way that I also wish sometimes that I I imagine myself unseen by the world. Like, I deal with the scrutiny that women are given to, um, subjected to by just pretending that no one can really see me, you know? So that's one way of dealing with it. But it also means, I think, that I look very carefully out. Um, and I wonder if that's a connection in a general sense of maybe that's a way that women as artists are given a kind of hand up by the way we learn to be in the world because we are so observed and we take that in and we're so used to being judged not exclusively by how we look but first by how we look. Like everything about us is kind of framed by how we look. And so when, when you live your life with that being something of importance to you, how can you not look at the world around you really carefully? You know, like, and get, maybe that's part of why I can get so caught up in looking at stupid stuff that most people don't even <laughs> look twice at, you know? Like, what color is the sky today? Number 500,000th time, you know? <laughs> maybe there's a connection, I don't know. That's a very nice answer, actually. Um, you know, in Columbus, uh, we, for the most part, it, it has been um, the state capital and OSU, and recently it's becoming an arts destination. Uh, you are from Long Beach, California. Uh, you came here to go to grad school, and you're still here. Um, 
as a serious painter, and I think I know the answer to this, but I think it's worth asking. Um, as a serious painter, have you ever thought of, that you needed to leave here and go somewhere else to pursue painting? Oh, yeah. You have? Yeah. Yeah. I can't imagine an artist who hasn't really grappled with that. And I don't know that many people who feel really clear and settled in the decision that they've come to either. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Maybe, yeah. I mean, like any place, Columbus has its great benefits and Columbus has its serious drawbacks as a place for artists to live. And it may just be, uh, I, I have a feeling it's a perpetual grass is greener type of issue for most people. Um, but I think for the type of work that I do, especially, um, it's very purposefully reliant on being seen in person. And so, um, <coughs> I have this dream that there's a paradise world in some major metropolitan area with a big art market where there would be more people who were willing to like, get engaged to the level that my work needs to be engaged with in person. Um, my work doesn't circulate very well photographically, like you often can't see it very well. Um, and so I think, gosh, you know, it'd probably be great to live someplace with maybe a bigger art market than Columbus has, just because Columbus is not a large city. But Columbus is also um, a place where I've been able to pay my bills and have a studio for 20, 25 years now, which I'm not sure is the case in many other places. Um, Columbus has had not 50 people who I'm dying to work with at a time, but a really steady presence of people who I deeply respect and admire and am really excited to work with. And I feel like I kind of like get my tentacles out into the rest of the world through them um, while I can stay here and be in my studio and do my work um, in my modest way. Um, but it's a really complicated question, you know? And I, I feel like it's hard to discuss without seeming like I'm being negative about one choice or the other. But I think it's like lots of things in life. You pick one thing, you can't necessarily pick two things at the same time. And you pick one thing and occasionally you're kind of looking over your shoulder and thinking, ah, I don't know. It's sort of part of life. But you do stay informed and you produce terrific work here in Columbus. Thanks, yeah, yeah. And I feel like Columbus has been really good to me in terms of the opportunities that I've had and the people I've been able to work with and the things I've been able to do. I mean, I feel very happy in that way. And I go to New York as often as I can, you know. I read, I, you know, participate in the ways that I can. So this exhibit has been on for five weeks. All of us here at the gallery, um, we're here almost every day and we have thoroughly enjoyed living with your work. And we are very much enamored of it. And thank you for the opportunity for allowing us to share this work. Um, and thank you to everyone for coming. Uh, please hang around and spend some more time with the work. And you can talk to Laura. <laughs> Thanks.